I was scheduled to go, and that Friday before, um, my wife was very supportive of me going to this program. I went to the website. I was like, what is Mighty Oats? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going like, now. Should, let me figure I'm out what it is. I'm, I'm on the schedule. I got the week <laughs> off. Let me figure out what I'm going to. <laughs> and the first thing I saw was faith-based. And my heart dropped. Hello and welcome to the Mighty Oak Show today. Very glad to have you with me and uh, looking forward to another great conversation. Thank you for joining wherever it is you are joining from. And I know we have a lot of folks over at Mojo 5.0. Uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you for listening. Uh, we were just talking about Mojo this morning and what a great partner they've been and uh, so thankful to be there and for all of you who listen every week. Thank you for doing that. For those that are listening on the podcast or from the podcast, uh, thank you for doing that. Please make sure that you subscribe to the podcast platform so that this show is delivered to you every week and uh, that would be awesome and for everyone take some time to go over to YouTube you can find our channel there go to YouTube search for Mighty Oaks Mighty Oaks programs Mighty Oaks warrior program <laughs> Mighty Oaks show you put Mighty Oaks in there you're gonna find our channel I promise uh, go check that out you can find our channel click on our channel and then subscribe and then when you're done subscribing Hit that notification bell, and uh, that will uh, notify you as soon as this content and other content comes online. We have so much that we're putting out all of the time, and I uh, wanted to share that with you. And uh, maybe if you have followed our social media, you've seen recently we've been talking about the watch feature for our content off of our website. Our website is mightyoaksprograms.org. And we put so much content on YouTube and we produce so much video content, we wanted to have one place where all of that could be found. And you can find that on our website, mightyoaksprograms.org. In the menu bar, there's a place uh, simply called Watch, and you can go and find all of our shows there. Very easy to find, very easy to understand. Um, our blog is also linked there. A lot of good information there, a lot of good content. So please take some time to check that out. That would be awesome. Thank you for doing it. And uh, again, always thankful to be able to spend this time with you. My guest today is Brandon Bettis. Brandon is coming to us via Zoom by way of Arizona, and uh, Brandon is a um, financial advisor, financial planner by day, <laughs> that's his job, um, but uh, also a Mighty Oaks Programs graduate, served in the United States Army, and we're going to talk about all that today. Uh, Brandon, appreciate uh, you jumping on and taking some time to talk to us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Anything I can do to help out Mighty Oaks and uh, help out others, so... I try to plan ahead when it comes to this show, and uh, this was one of those where I didn't plan ahead very, very well. So <laughs> thanks for the last minute. Uh, I think two days ago I said, hey, would you mind uh, coming on? And, uh, and you did, so thanks for doing it. Um, Brandon, let's, uh, let's just start with, with your story, your background. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but, but talk to us about where you were raised, how you were raised, and ultimately what led you into a military career. Yeah, so uh, I was born and raised in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, spent most of my adult life here until I entered the military, um, but born into a good family. Um, we, we were raised, my, my, my parents met in a uh, Christian non-denominational church um, called The Truth. Um, and so early childhood, I was, I was raised in the church. Um, parents eventually divorced and um the, the church kind of turned their back on us if you will so we lost mm. a lot of support so that was about fifth sixth grade um and so that was really the only kind of um bad thing early on i guess you could say but for mm. the most part um great life two sisters um solid family support um just a kind of a normal childhood if you will um and uh my dad was in the military my dad was a a Green Beret in Vietnam, served a couple wow. years in Vietnam. He's what they call shake and bake NCO. And, mm. and being a Green Beret in Vietnam is one of those things where, you know, as a kid, I would see his military stuff. Right. And I thought he was just bigger than life. He was just this hero. Later on, it, it revealed that he really, he really did like one mission uh, in Cambodia. So oh, wow. not really a, you know, war hero. No movies are going to be made about him. But <laughs> he planted the seed uh, for a military career. And then especially, you know, kind of playing G.I. Joe's like most young boys do. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to do. That was really the only thing I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, I had two big passions in life early on was ASU, Arizona State University, and the Army. Um, and I was able to accomplish both of those. So yeah. um, that's how I kind of ended up in the military service. I actually joined right out of high school, but, um, you know, it wasn't the right time for me. So I actually left military service after only three months and then 
kind of my plan unraveled. And so I enrolled in Arizona State. Um, yeah. 9-11 was my freshman year. Oh, wow. I almost dropped out of school um, to be able to go join the, join, rejoin the military right away. Um, but my dad and my stepdad were a little bit smarter than I was, and they said, you're an idiot. Go change your degree. Get, <laughs> get a degree. The war will still be there. Uh, you know, when you graduate, so, uh, finished up my degree and then went in, um, again, I was going to go in enlisted in the army cause all I wanted to do was kick in doors and blow stuff up. Sure. And, um, again, they told me I was an idiot, go be an officer. <laughs> and so I applied for officer candidate school, got accepted and then joined the army in 2006. Um, and so, so that's what kind of led me to the, to the army. I, uh, I always find it fascinating when I talk to people and as I'm getting older, there's more of these folks who, <laughs> who went into the military post 9-11. You know, I, I went into the military, I went into the Marine Corps in 96. Um, there wasn't a whole lot going on. I, I ended up in Iraq, but that was at the end of my military or my time in the military. Um, and I always find it fascinating when someone experiences 9-11, they see what happened, they know what the consequences of military service are, and they go anyhow. Um, but for you, you know, a lot of us thought, well, 9-11 happened, we're deployed to Afghanistan. So my, my battalion, uh, my infantry battalion was supposed to deploy to Afghanistan shortly after, after September 11th uh, in support of what was happening there. And we got pulled at the last minute. We weren't going. We were told to stand down. And, and all of us, I mean, it was like this depression set in over the battalion because like, well, this thing's gonna be over in a month or two, so we're done. I mean, this is it, we're not going anywhere. Um, you know, and then we ended up in Iraq a year later, so it all, it all came back around. But um, for you though, you saw 9-11 happen, you, you saw the beginning of the war, which we thought was gonna be very close to the end of the war, but by 2006, uh, things had gone horribly wrong in a lot of ways. There were a lot of, you know, very difficult things happening the real consequences of combat, and yet you still decided to go in. Um, can you maybe articulate that a little bit? I think that's hard for people to understand. Why, when you see all of that happen, would you still want to go into the military? Is it, is it love of country? Is it a desire to serve? You know, what is it that motivates you on the other side of that? Yeah, no, a great question, because like I said, that seed was planted early on, and you know, I look back on my life and it could have been very different where, you know, that first time I joined right out of high school, um, you know, I went in with like a, you know, 11 x-ray contract with the, which is like a contract to go to ranger school right after basic training and stuff. And so I had this whole plan all laid out. And actually when I was in processing, I got recruited by the old guard because I'm, I'm six foot six. And so with the infantry, with army infantry, right. they just find the tall guys and be like, Hey, you want to go to DC? Um, and so ironically, if things had panned out, how I planned, I would have been um, in DC in, in Arlington on, on 9-11. So I could wow. have been part of the support effort to, you know, help with the Pentagon and stuff. And I, I talked to guys that were there later on when I served in the old guard and, um, and they talked about watching the plane fly over Arlington and, and then hit the Pentagon. So, you know, life happens in mysterious ways, but you know, I just knew, I just knew I wasn't. And the best way I can kind of summarize it is, I kind of compare it to that speech um, with Patton at the beginning of Patton when he talks about, you know, when you're talking to your grandkids someday, do you want to tell right. them that you were shoveling pig poop on a farm in Iowa or do you want to be part right. of the great, you know, generation? And so I, I kind of had that feeling. Yeah. Um, I just knew. I knew that no matter what I was going to do in life, the Army was going to make me better at it. Um, I remember at one point interviewing with the DEA for an internship and I talked to them about my plan. And I said, yeah, I'm going to graduate college. I'm going to go in the army for three years. I'm going to be a cop for three years. And then I'm going to jo go join federal law enforcement. And I remember the DEA agent like asked me, he's like, why wouldn't you just join the DEA right now? I'm like, nope, I'm serving. I right. want to serve. I, I think right. I'm going to gain the experience um, in the military for future life. And he kind of looked at me. He's like, that's the best plan I've ever heard. Like, kind of keep that plan. So I've always thought long term. Um, and I always knew I never wanted to be a 70 year old man. And I didn't serve my country. And and even with my wife, my, me and my wife met my sophomore year of, of college, which was post 9-11. And we were dating for about three months. And I looked her in the eye and we started getting serious and, you know, long-term relationship. I looked her in the eye and said, Aaron, when I graduate college, I'm going to the Army. And this is, you know, 2002, 2003 time frame. I was like, I'm going. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't know where we're going to be at, but I'm joining. And I, I kind of gave her, I gave her the out then. I was like, if you want to leave now, yeah. no hard feelings. Um, but just know that, you know, this is what I'm going to do with my life. 
Um, and ironically, it worked out because 2006 was the surge. Um, so, you know, um, I think it helped me get accepted to OCS. It helped mm. me kind of fast track my career, it helped me get, you know, some of the things I wanted yeah. because recruiting was higher. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to get a small bonus as an officer, uh, which is rare. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's un- unheard of. <laughs> right. Um, so it just kind of accelerated everything. So everything worked out for, for the reason. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things like, and that was why, that's why I wanted to go enlisted after college too. Cause I was like, Hey, this war is going to be over. Yep. I don't have time. Yep. I don't have time to go train to be an officer. I just <laughs> right. want to go to basic training and get deployed right. right away. First thing smoking. Um, and, and again, it was one of those things where like, cooler heads prevail. It's like, listen, like this is not a short term solution. I right. just go in, kick in doors and blow stuff up. Like, yeah. Think about long term. So, uh, everything just worked out for a reason, and, and I have no regrets um, about when I joined, where I joined, how I joined. Um, so it, it, it all worked out for a reason. And I, even some of my college buddies, when I talked to them, they asked the same question. They said, "Why would you do that? You know, why would you go?" Right. You know, they they saw what's going on in Iraq. Yep. Everything's unraveling, and it, it's it sounds so silly now, but at the time, I kind of justified. Like, listen, if something happens to me, and I you know give the ultimate sacrifice. My funeral is going to be really cool. If you <laughs> if you graduate ASU and get hit by a bus tomorrow, sorry, like, I'm going to have that parade. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it seems silly, it seems silly at the time, but it was true. There was an element of that. I was like, you know, I want to serve for a higher purpose. I want right. to serve um, and make my life uh, mean something. And and a military was the easy way to do it. So yeah. Um, so with all of that, we'll talk about kind of your larger story. But with all of that, and now we're living through this kind of Afghanistan mess. Um, has that changed how you felt about your story, your service, what you did? I know a lot of people are struggling with that. No, I, I, I've been asked that question um, over the summer when, when the withdrawal happened with Afghanistan. And um, there was a good, there's a good Netflix documentary that talks about, um, you know, the history of Afghanistan and leading up to 9-11 and then post 9-11 is really good, you know, informative series. Yeah. Um, and the way I kind of summarized it was my small piece of the pie. So I was deployed to Afghanistan in 2009, 2010. I was an executive officer in the Korangal Valley. Um, so I only had one deployment, but I kind of like to say it was like the mother of all deployments. Mm. You know, as an infantry guy in the yeah. Korangal Valley, the quote, Valley of Death. At the time, it was the most austere and um, kinetic place on the face of the planet, practically. Um, and it was the Wild West. And we just had free reign to close with and destroy the enemy is which what, what we signed up to do. And um, so I just only had that one deployment, but yeah. man, it was, a, it was a great deployment. So my small piece of the pie, um, I saw that as being successful. Um, you know, my job was to go over there and support the guys on the ground, um, you know, try to bring yeah. stability to the small port part of the right. world of the Kunar province and, and try to help the civilian populace and then root out the Taliban. And we were successful. And so when I look at the grand scope and the grand scheme of Afghanistan, um, I, I'd be foolish to sit there and say that I knew better. Um, sure. I believe I believe in the leaders and the people that have dedicated their lives to that complex quagmire that is Afghanistan. Right. And I trust in their decision. Um, of course, it'd be easy for me to sit on my couch and, and second guess them and, and troubleshoot um, the way that we pulled out of Afghanistan. Sure. I, yeah. I have some issues on that. But, of course. Um, you know, I look at the grand scope of things and I was like, you know what, it w- I wasn't in that position to make a decision. Um, so I trust the people that were, um, and you know, I just, I just pray that, um, you know, the people out of Afghanistan and the, and the folks that do struggle with it and the folks that did give their lives for the stability of Afghanistan or Iraq, yeah. I hope they find peace in it and just understand that we're all small cogs in the wheel sure. and we can do our own little small part. So, um, I don't necessarily have any struggles with Afghanistan. Um, it, it, it's a it's just a, a mountain of a problem and a mountain sure. of an issue. Um, I'm just kind of I am kind of happy that we kind of went over there and we tried our best, if you will. We tried sure. our best. Sure. Um, and there's a lot of people that made a lot of difference, and we yeah. should all think about that and say, "Hey, my small piece did I make a difference?" And yeah. I can sleep easy at night knowing that I did. So that's a that's a great perspective. I think it's the right perspective. I feel like the veterans that and the service members that are struggling with Afghanistan with everything that's happened in Afghanistan it's because they're focused on really the wrong thing if you went there with the intention of serving your country of 
Uh, I mean, ultimately, particularly in Afghanistan, preventing another 9-11, finding the bad guys who brought 9-11 yeah. to our country. If you went there to do that, we did that. And, and there's a lot of honor in that. Now, what our politicians have decided to do on the other side is, you know, again, yeah. debatable. I mean, there's a lot of bad. I think that's very clear. Um, but even in the 20 years we were there, there's a lot of debate that could be had over should we have been there that long and should we have done the things that we did. But for service members, man, so many men and women serve so honorably and, and there's zero shame in that. And we can take great pride in that. And I think that's a very Agreed. important 100, perspective. hundred percent. I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, and this is the stuff I talk with like when it comes to, you know, if I work with a financial client, I'm a big believer in control what you can control. Yes. You know, yes. like if you went to Afghanistan and you controlled your performance and you controlled what you did and you served honorably, that's all we can ask of you. Right. Um, same thing in, in a personal life. If you can control how you treat your wife, how you treat your kids, how much money are you saving towards your goals, like little stuff like yeah. that. Like quit worrying about the stock market, quit worrying about the bigger picture, quit right. worrying about, um, you know, quit spending so much time on, on who the president <laughs> is at the time focus on your little piece of the pie and, and yeah. we can all live a better life if we just kind of control what we can control. So, I, I was just having that conversation yesterday in a, uh, a Bible study and I was explaining that, you know, f from my perspective, the way I view life is I try to break things into left and right. The things I can control <laughs> and the things I can't control. Yep. And I think anxiety and worry and, and all of that comes into, into our lives when we're looking at the things we have zero control over instead of just simply doing what we can do. And, and you know, as, as Christians, as people of faith, the what I can't control is, that's where I need to trust God to control what God can control, but I can do 100%. my part. And man, there's, you're exactly right. That's, that's the right perspective. That's the one that keeps us moving forward. Um, what was your faith like as a, a young man, you know, in college and then serving in the military and, you know, particularly while you were in Afghanistan? What was, what was your relationship with God like at that time? Um, so I, I would, I would, I would classify as non-existent, if you will. Um, growing up as a young man, we, we went to church, you know, like I said, um, I was kind of born into the church. Um, you know, that's kind of all I knew growing up, right. um, up until probably fifth or sixth grade. We, um, the, 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 the faith that we were is, is classified as Christian non-denominational. Um, but when I look back on the actual organization, um, again, it's called, I think it was called the truth. And I probably should research it a little bit more. And, uh, my family was involved in it. My, my, I still have family members in, in that organization and not a knock against them, but, um, it was, it, from the outside looking in, it felt, it felt very cultish. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we had a lot of rules and regulations and like yeah. the women couldn't wear pants. Um, you know, we, we weren't allowed to have a TV growing up. We went to Bible study on Wednesday and then church on twice on Sunday. Um, but that was our sports system. That's all I knew. Yeah. And, and once, a, once a year, we would go to what we call a convention um, as a gathering um, in Southern Arizona. And, and we had fun there because, you know, we were just kids and we were playing. And the good thing about the church is they never forced, forced religion on us. Like right. I knew what we were doing. I knew what we were praying. We were singing songs. I had my favorite songs and stuff like that as a young kid. Um, but I don't think I really understand the context. And actually, I was I was getting close to professing, which is you know the equivalent of like you know being baptized, because they let us they let children choose. They don't really force it on you. I was getting close to professing when things kind of unraveled. So, kind of took a step back, and um, you know as I got a little older into high school and college, I started you know kind of researching and, and looking at faith and looking at different religions and. Nothing ever really clicked with me um, in Afghanistan. I remember in the military, I would, I would go to church services. I, I liked the Lutheran church services, like during basic training, just to kind of have a support system, just kind of have a um, a, a break or relieve, if you will, from basic training. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, sometimes it's just something yeah. different. Right, right. Um, I, I do remember a very significant moment in Afghanistan um, that I went to. I was struggling with, you know, just being away from home. Um, this was right on Christmas time, 2009. Um, first time away from home, I, I had a newborn baby daughter, um, and Christmas time was always tough for my family or significant because my wedding anniversary is December 21st. Oh. <laughs> my birthday is December 22nd, wow. and my daughter's very first birthday was December 23rd. No way. And then going wow. right into Christmas Eve. So, <laughs> so that time frame, you know, things yeah. are slowing down operationally. You have a lot of time to sit around and think. Right. And I was struggling, you know, spiritually. And so I remember talking to the chaplain and and ask him, I was like, hey, I don't really have a relationship with God. I don't have a relationship with religion. Um, I was attending the services and, you know, kind of going through the motions. And 
And he kind of told me, he's like, just pray on it. He's like, pray on it, ask God, um, and, and you'll get your answer. And so I remember praying really hard in Afghanistan. I'm like, all right, God, I need a sign. I need, I need something, um, you know, help guide me. And yeah. um, at the time, I didn't, I didn't receive an answer back. So I was, I was a little more um, agnostic. And then that started to kind of shift my faith more towards an atheist. Um, and so probably post, Afghanistan and probably the last 10 years or so, I, I consider myself an atheist, more of an atheist, non-believer. Um, I didn't believe in necessarily any higher power. I didn't believe in any kind of organized religion. Um, so that was kind of my relationship early on, um, yeah. if you will, until I'm sure we'll get into it until, until the mighty Oaks kind of came in yeah. and um, kind of switched everything on its head. <laughs> Literally 180. So Look, looking back at that, could the chaplain have said something or done something that would have helped you deal with that better? I don't think so. I, I think looking back on it, I think that was the perfect answer at the time. And, and he gave a story um, of his faith um, that he was a young man in college and he was, he was looking at seminary or he was looking at, you know, a traditional um, life and he prayed on it. Like he was, he was, you know, drinking, womanizing, he was sinning and, yeah. and he prayed on it, you know, and he received an answer and he, he went to seminary and he, he devoted his life to a, a military chaplain and a, and a Catholic. And so I, I, I really do think like back on that moment, like that was almost, the, that was the answer I needed at that time hmm. versus trying to shove something down my throat versus trying to convert me versus, um, I think he probably could have done a better job of saying, Hey, here's some scripture to read or here's, right. here's a plan or here's a path. Right. Um, but really at the end of the day, he's like, you just gotta ask, you gotta ask God and, and God's going to answer. Um, so, yeah. um, when I look at my life now versus how it was, there was a lot of little seeds being planted. There was a lot of little different moments. There was a lot of significance mm. um, that I understand that it was all part of God's path. And at that time, um, maybe that was part of God's path that he's like, right. yep, not yet. Um, and so I, I look at that. Um, but, you know, I was, I was seeking the answers. I was looking, I was questioning. I was, I was willing to do the research. I was willing to do the, the time and, yeah. and, and just pray on it at the end yeah. of the day. So. So after you went home from Afghanistan, what did what did that look like, and and how did kind of your life unfold from there going forward? Yeah, so um, as soon as I got home from Afghanistan, you know, I, me and my wife were married in 2007. Our daughter was born in 2008, uh, and then I deployed in May of 2009. So, but when I got home, my daughter was 18 months old, and I mm. only spent maybe four months of her life. Yeah with her. Yep. Um, so it was really about bringing the family back together and having stability. So we, we redeployed back to Fort Carson, Colorado. And, um, I was looking for, I was looking to get out. I was looking to get out of the military. I was looking at jobs and options. But again, since that's really all I ever wanted to do, I, I was really kind of lost and didn't know what to do. So I remember talking to my wife about it. And I said, Hey, you know, we kind of have two options. We can either kind of get out right now. I don't have any more service obligation. I did my three years. We can get out. We can move somewhere else. We can start a new life, um, or we can stay and we can PCS to Fort Benning, Georgia, um, and and continue this military career. And we we discussed it and talked about it. And I said, if we decide to stay in the military, it's a five year decision because I was scheduled to go to the captain's career course. I was scheduled to do you know company command and training. I'm like, it's a five year decision. We can't we can't move and then yeah. six months later decide to get out. Like right. we have to either right. commit to a few more years or get out now. Um, and neither of us really wanted, we didn't know what life would look like as a civilian. So we decided to stay in. So we moved to Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, I requested some stability so that we had a second daughter. I wanted some stability to kind of watch my daughter grow up. So I served in a basic training brigade as an operations officer and had some stability, did the career course. And then um, we, our second daughter was born in Georgia. And so I was able to, be around for the first year of her life and then we moved to Fort Bliss, Texas and I did a company mm. command at Fort Bliss, Texas um, and then I did that for about a year and then we moved to uh, Fort Myer, Virginia um, to, I, I was selected for the old guard which is like a ceremonial yeah. unit similar to 8th and I. Um, that was my dream job. That was that was one of the reasons I wanted to enlist was go be you know in the old guard. Um, so we left there. So, um, so I got home in 2010 so about that that six year period after Afghanistan was just a kind of a whirlwind of multiple moves. We were never in a location longer than two years, um, you know, raising a family, you know, bouncing around the country and stuff like that. So it, it feels like a whirlwind. Um, and uh, so it was just kind of busy and that, that kind of added a little bit of stress and stuff like that. And then yeah. 
And then I looked up in 2015 while in the old guard and we decided to leave active duty after that. So, um, but yeah, just really raising a family. So that was the kind of focus after Afghanistan was raising a family and yeah. trying to find some stability and figure out what my military career was going to look like. Yeah. Um, and just kind of taking it day by day. When did, uh, you know, some of the friction and some of the, you know, some of the challenges, some of the difficulties in your life, um, you know, you and I have talked about and, you know, kind of what led you to coming to a program eventually. When did that begin and, and, and what did what did that look like? What was kind of the genesis of it? And then what did that look like as you went and tried to deal with it on your own? Yeah, gr great question. Um, it, it's kind of hard to, it's not necessarily a sequence of events, but I noticed, I noticed after Afghanistan, I didn't necessarily have any kind of like trauma or PTSD or anything like that, but yeah. I did notice that, you know, there were struggles within my marriage. Uh, my wife and I were, you know, young family living in rural Alabama, trying to hmm. figure out life. And, yeah. um, you know, like any other kind of marriage, trying to kind of figure it out and there's stress and she's worried about work and, you know, there's financial struggles. And um, I was very selfish at the time. I was, I was selfish for a lot of my military career where it's like, hey, you're following me. Um, so that added stress to her, um, raising young, two young daughters raised, you know, stress. So there was a lot of stress and tension. Yeah. Um, we did some marital counseling. I, I was having, I noticed more anger issues that I would lash out more either through frustration or yeah. through stress. And, and again, I'm not sure if it's tied to, you know, Afghanistan specifically, but it, it definitely was tied to the military service because, you know, military, you're infantry officer by day and then you try to go home and be a daddy to two sure. girls at night. Yep. Yep. And it's very, it's my way to the highway. And, yep. and that doesn't really bode well in a, in a house full of women. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I just kind of noticed struggles. I, you know, I, I was, I, I've, ever since high school, probably I've suffered with, you know, suicidal ideations. I noticed those were kind of coming more prominent. It was, um, there was a lot of what's next. There's a lot of big purpose, big picture ideas of what does my life look like? Um, you know, it felt like I accomplished all my goals, you know, initially of being in the military and, and deploying and it's kind of like okay what's next what else is there yeah you know like and so so there was just a lot of mind games um going on in my brain and the the moves and the stress of you know having a successful career didn't help and then the marriage struggles didn't help and then kids and out lashing, lashing at them and having anger issues didn't help and stuff like that so um that was one of the that was one of the big reasons to kind of leave active duty because we wanted stability we wanted to go back home and yeah you know, kind of focus on what's really important right. to us. And family right. was always number one. Family was, we wanted our girls to have stability. Um, I wanted my wife to have stability. I wanted my wife to have an identity outside the military, not just military spouse. Um, and so that kind of compounded in up into 2015 or so. And it was like, it's time to, it's time to leave. This is, this is going to break us. Military service is going to break us. Yeah. Um, if we continue down this path and continue with this fast paced um, environment. Um, and plus the wars were kind of, wars were kind of dying yeah, down at right, that time. So, right. um, again, I, I just wanted to go blow stuff up and there was yeah. less stuff to blow up. So yeah. it's like, Hey, let's, let's take a step back and reevaluate what our life looks like moving forward. Yeah. Um, hopefully what, that answers the question. A yeah, bit. no, that's good. What, so then you transitioned out and I think a lot of, uh, veterans or service members who become veterans as they transition out, that transition is more difficult than they expect. And the other side of it doesn't look the way they thought it might. Um, mm -hmm. was that your experience as well? hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was, I was lost. I was lost for, um, gosh, I'd probably call it 18 months, two years. Um, you know, especially during a transition because it, it felt like everything came to a screeching halt. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was in my dream assignment. I was in, I was a senior captain looking at getting promoted to major. Um, I wasn't necessarily an ideal candidate for, you know, promotion to field grade officer. So there was, there's some of that apprehension. Um, and, and I was smart enough to, you know, going back to, you know, the ultimatum I gave my wife when we were dating, I kind of looked at her, I'm like, all right, Aaron, you followed me for 10 years. You've sacrificed a lot. It's time for me to sacrifice for you. Where do you want to go? And she said, Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time I was like, I don't want to go to Phoenix. I know what Phoenix has to offer. <laughs> and I was born and raised there. Like, right. let's go somewhere cool. Right. Um, but that's where she wanted to go. She wanted stability for the family. And so I said, okay, I'm going to sacrifice for you and, and I really dove into that military transition, which really helped me. Um, I would recommend it to any you know veterans. There's a lot there's a lot of programs out there, like skill break programs, the internship type programs. I was fortunate enough to find one of those during my transition because when I, when I submitted my paperwork on the officer side, 
there's no commitment. So you're really kind of resigning yeah. and right. um, you kind of set a date. And I set my date for like six months. So I had six months of mm. fast and furious, like, okay, time to try to figure out what you're going to do when you grow up. Yep. And, and luckily my command was really supportive of me. Um, they were supportive of the transition. They allowed me to do the, the a fellowship with UPS and, and kind of start learning those skills, the networking skills, the, you know, interview skills, the resume skills, stuff yep. like that. Um, and, uh, the way I became, so I get the question a lot of like, how did you go from being an infantry officer, knuckle dragger to a financial planner? <laughs> and <laughs> again, it's all part of God's plan. Uh, you know, I look back on it. I don't, I don't know how or why, but, um, when we were in Alabama, we were struggling financially. I was making good money, but it still felt like we were living paycheck to paycheck. And, um, I found Dave Ramsey and I started, mm. you know, the Dave Ramsey plan of getting out of debt and we were yeah. able to get out of debt and we were debt free. And I was starting to take my personal finances really seriously. And I started teaching that to my soldiers when I was in company command. Like I would, you know, have that class of like, Hey, don't go buy the yeah. Mustang at 26% interest. Um, I would bring in financial advisors, kind of teach them life skills, if you will. Um, so I kind of had a passion for that, but I went to a job fair um, in San Antonio, Texas, and, and I randomly dropped off an application at Edward Jones. Um, I was looking for more operations manager jobs. I figured I'd get a, a job at you know, Amazon or UPS or something, something in leadership or management. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I dropped off this application, I didn't expect anything to come from it. But the more people I talked to and the more financial advisors I talked to and, and people in this industry, um, they talked, it, it was less about the, the nuances of um, you know, the stock market and yeah. buying and trading and yeah. selling all the, all the numbers. Yeah. It was more about just caring about people. <clears throat> right. And so the more they talked to me and the more I talked to them, I found out this is my, my next passion in life. And I really felt like a calling to it. Yeah. Um, but even then it, it was still a struggle. So we moved back home in October, 2016. I started studying for all my licenses right away. And I had some time to kind of absorb this new life. Um, but again, it, adds different stress. Okay, now it's time to buy a house. Now it's time to get reintegrated with family, friends, yep. figure out your old life. Um, and I, I, I mentor a lot of veterans now, and I talk about that transition. And a couple of the key things I tell them, I said, just be prepared mentally and be prepared to have a break in service, whether it's a week or a day or a month or a year. And I, I tell them, I'm like, go camping for a week mm. by yourself and just really think hard about what you want your life to look like. Right. Um, cause I wish I had done that, um, and really kind of process that, that transition. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I joke with, with people, um, that want to become financial advisors. I, I tell them, I'm like, listen, here's my career. Here's my background. You know, infantry officer, Afghanistan served, did a lot of cool kind of macho things. And I would say, I'm like, I never cried. I never <laughs> cried during basic training. I never cried during, you know, some of the school I went to. I never cried yeah. in the middle of a firefight. There was a day in july of 2017 ish where i was knocking on doors in in, in arizona in the summer trying to drum up clients for my yeah. financial advising business yeah. to try to be a successful financial advisor literally knocking on doors asking people if they needed financial advice and i sat in my truck and cried like a baby mm. and it was everything compounding on me of the transition the move struggles with my marriage struggles with my career i lost my identity as a as a soldier yeah. Um, my, my kids were, my, my daughter just got in trouble at school or she was sick at school and I cried like a baby it's sitting in my truck in the neighborhood. And so I tell them, like, just be prepared because there's going to come a day when it kind of just hits you like a ton of bricks that your life is different. And, and I don't think enough people take that time to process that. Yeah. Um, and I, th yeah. I think that's why we see a lot of struggles with, with veterans transitioning because they, they have this old identity. Yeah. And they can't, they can't separate it and they can't, um, you know, kind of figure out what life is next. And maybe cause they're not thinking about it, maybe cause they just don't know. Um, but it, it's really important. It's really important to sit there and figure out what life looks like after the military, no matter when, whether you retire or whether you only did two or three years. Yeah. Um, it's a significant, it's a significant event. Um, that we need to take seriously. That identity piece is, is so important too. I, Again, it's hard to articulate for people that haven't been through it, but, you know, like you, I, so I decided I wanted to be in the military when I was a teenager. Um, 
smarter people than me spoke into my life and said, you need to go to college. So I did. Uh, I wanted to enlist. My dad said, you can do whatever you want, but you're going to go to college first. And then a good family friend said, look, if you're going to go to college anyhow, you might as well go through a commissioning program. And you know, I became a Marine Corps uh, infantry officer. I left the Marine Corps. Coming home from Iraq, a month later, I was out of the Marine Corps. And um, I was a mess. And, and you know, people ask me, was it post-traumatic stress? Was it I don't think so. I think, you know, I was just a mess. I had lost myself. I mean, I spent, you know, basically the previous 15 years um, focused on one thing. I did that one thing. Now I was, for me, I was working at a church and um, just lost. I didn't know who I was. I was angry at everyone. They didn't understand what it was like, you know, all that stuff. But when I look back on it now, I understand so much of it was just my identity was so wrapped up in the military and then it's, it, it's almost a false um, leadership environment in a lot of ways because everything is fed to you. So you lead where you are, but it, it's not, I'm figuring this out on my own. I'm taking this and going forward. It's, you need to do this, figure out how to do that. Now you need to do this, so we're going to figure that out. And it's, it's almost this false leadership environment. So you get out of that, and now you look around, and... Um, Man, I, I can feel that that heartbreak of looking around and going. I, and I didn't knock on doors to try to get financial clients, but um, in a lot of ways, it felt exactly the same. I didn't know how to be married. I didn't really know how to raise kids, even though I had two of them. <laughs> I didn't know how to do anything, and it was so overwhelming. That identity thing is is just so important. Yeah, and, and I, I thank you for sharing that with me because I, I didn't I didn't know that very path. Like we we have very similar kind of paths in right. life, if you will, and. Um, you know, it, and, and even then you and I are having this conversation of, you know, we have a college degree, we were officers, like the amount of opportunities that we had now compare that to, you know, someone who, you know, barely got through high school and right. they found identity in the military and they either left service either through a medical reason or whatever. Like imagine how much that's compounded on mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And that's what, that's what really breaks my heart when I see, you know, these young, young guys that don't have a support system or they don't have that, they can't take that step back and, and, you know, kind of fall back on a past experience. They can't fall back on a degree or whatever yeah. it is. And um, like you said, it, it's significant. And, you know, we joke about how the military brainwashes you and, and <laughs> turns you into a robot, but there's an element to that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like there's, there's so much given to you and there's so many resources and, and even when you're in the service, everyone talks about it. They're like, oh, I'm going to get out. I'm going to make $100,000. Right, I'm going to be a contractor. Right. I'm going to make so much money in IT. And it's like, okay, good luck. Yeah. Like, have fun with that. And right. so I think we're, everyone everyone has a rude awakening. Um, we, you know, we don't think about all the, you know, just where to find food. You know, you right. a kid right. growing up in the parish, so you, right. you have three squares of meal every day. And it's like, okay, man, you're out. Learn how to pay bills. Learn how to find a mortgage. Learn how to find a job. We're not a network. Yeah. Like going to a networking event yeah. and trying to you know find a job like there's so many intangible skills that um and then you compound that with whatever trauma and whatever stresses they have in their life and it's it's overbearing it's overwhelming yeah and um it, it, I, I just hope that more people can kind of take a step back and kind of get support and get help and ask the answers and seek answers um to whatever they're struggling with and just take one more step forward whether it's hey how do i how do i buy a suit yeah. How do I interview? How do I yeah. do a resume? How, yeah. how do I how do I find my passion? How do I how do I pay rent? You know, little stuff, little stuff that we take for granted. Um, it is it all compounds and during that time. So yeah, absolutely, I agree, hundred percent. Other than you know, be ready for something to happen that that emotional kind of meltdown moment. What other advice do you give to someone who's going through that transition? I mean, as you know, as a financial advisor, you probably talk to a lot of folks. What are some of the other key pieces of advice that? Someone just needs to know <laughs> as they yeah, transition. No, so, so a couple of key pieces of advice that I always, so I, I, I volunteer on uh, Veterati, which is a national service that links transition military or, or even, even veterans with, you know, folks in the community. Some of them are veterans, some of them are, you know, high level CEOs. It, it's a really cool service and program where you can just kind of talk to somebody for mentorship. And the, the, the two things that I always mention every single time, no matter who I'm talking to, I always ask them, I say, um, if money was no object, what would you do and why? And if you can't answer it right away, take the time to figure that out. Right, that's good. Whatever it is, whatever job it is, because someone asked that of me, and, and it was profound for me to take a step back and be like, huh, I never thought of it. And my answer was I would be the equipment manager for the Detroit Red Wings. 
you could, I could do that job for free. I, you know, or a hockey, a hockey team, a professional <laughs> hockey team. I, I would be an equipment manager. Yeah. And it's such a silly thing. I'm like, I don't care how much I would get paid. I would do it for free. Like, I would just love to do that. I would love to go to work every day and, and, and do that job. Um, and, but, you know, realistically, I couldn't take my family. I'm like, hey, I'm going to go start a career as a $20,000 <laughs> intern at a college hockey right. team. You know, so, but it, it put me in the mind frame of finding out what the next passion yeah. was. And then the second piece of advice I give everybody, especially during that, in the, in the midst of that transition or any time at life, really, I'd say there's three main criteria when it comes to transition, location, job satisfaction, and pay. If you transition from the military and your first role satisfies two out of those three requirements, mm -hmm. consider it a successful transition. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I use that advice when I was looking for a job because, you know, my wife and I talk and she's like, Phoenix, Arizona, that's it. I'm like, are you sure? We can go move to Germany. We can go move to Europe. We can go, the yeah. army will move us one more time. We can go anywhere in the world we want. She's right. like, nope, Phoenix, Arizona. Right. So when I was looking at careers and jobs, it had to be in Phoenix, Arizona. I could have been offered, I could have been offered a half million dollars a year job to play video games in Alaska and I would have turned it down <laughs> because right. that was number one on our yeah. list. Yeah. So really taking that hard time to figure out where you want to start your life. And then after that, I was looking for jobs that either paid really well or I loved. And, you know, mm. I, I was willing to take a job that paid me, you know, 120, 150, like Amazon was one of those jobs. Like I was, I was in the final stages of interviewing with Amazon to be a warehouse manager and the starting pay was like 120,000. But when I looked at what life looked like, it yeah. was, it looked miserable. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Like managing a warehouse yeah. of Amazon, not that it's a bad <laughs> thing, but it just wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, and luckily like fast forward five years, I was able to satisfy all three requirements. Awesome. I love my job it has unlimited income potential. I, I, it's a good paying job. And then it's in a location that I love. So for transition veterans, I always tell them like focus on those things and just try to narrow it down to that. That's good. Um, because most people just think they're just going to take any job that, they hire I'm like okay what if you hate it yeah um, you know so so thinking on those lines of what do you really want to do and why yeah um, you know a lot of people don't think about that you know if you want to be a sports broadcaster great you might not be the next Al Michaels but there's nothing to stop you from being a production assistant sure and working in the industry or working in sports entertainment or That's working in sports management or working in finance or working in law or, or medical field you know it might not be perfect you might not be a brain surgeon someday but there's nothing to say you can't be a, a registered nurse or an admin at a hospital if you that's really good. love the medical field. Yeah. So I'm um, trying, to, trying to narrow it down that way. That's good. I mean, that's great advice. But let's transition the story to eventually you ended up at a Mighty Oaks program. Um, and there were a lot of events that led up to that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when you showed up, you showed up still saying or claiming to be an atheist. You know, I don't believe in God. Um, so, so talk about that. So you finally got into your work, you got settled in Arizona, you're living your life. What were the events that led up to going to the program and then, you know, the consequence of attending that program? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so once I kind of took the uniform off and, and I actually was still in the reserves, um, so I didn't necessarily take the uniform off all the way, but you know, that 2006 to 2021 or 2016 to 2020, that five year period of being a civilian and starting a business, um, you know, it just kind of came with a lot of stresses and I noticed, you know, the anger issues weren't going away. The, mm -hmm. the marriage issues weren't going away. So I started going to therapy, um, just, you know, through a vet center, um, that was local here just to kind of vent, just to kind of talk about, you know, general problems. I, I noticed that therapy really helped me. Um, one of the things that we all talk about is, you know, filing for a VA claim. Um, and I, I filed a, a general VA claim to just kind of document any kind of injuries and stuff. And, and one of the things I talked about was my depression and suicidal ideations. And, and my initial response from the VA was, well, the first time you thought about, you know, suicidal ideations was in high school. So that's a pre-existing condition. So it's mm. not going to be covered. And so at the time I was like, I was like, okay, I just took that as, as face value. I'm like, okay, no big deal. Like right. I'm still, I still have a good life. Like I'm not debilitated, no big deal. Mm. Um, but as I was going through more therapy, I eventually you got to the end of talking. And I remember talking to, you know, the therapist and, and, and stuff like that. And I said, I'm still having these thoughts. I'm still having, you know, issues of bad days. And it would be just, I'd be debilitating for yeah. 48, 72 hours where I, I just, I just need to crawl into a hole. And uh, he eventually, you know, 
um, referred me to a psychiatrist and um, I was on a low dose of antidepressant. And then that's when I went back to the VA and said, hey, I might be on this medication for the rest of my life. I might have chronic depression and, and severe depression. Um, I want, you know, I, I would like to receive services. So I went back through the VA process. Um, I eventually got awarded um, 100% disability. So that kind of helped relieve some of the stress when it came to finances. Because it's a, it's a huge benefit. It, it took a lot of weight off my shoulders, especially as a financial advisor. I'm right. always thinking money. Right. Hey, when I have a, a, a check coming in every month, that, that takes a lot of stress off. Um, and then in 2019, um, yeah, 2019, my grandma passed away. She was kind of matriarch of her mm. family. And um, she was a great example. And I didn't have a trauma that, from that, but she was very financially independent and financially um, stable. And I received an inheritance. So, um, in a, in a, about a two year period, I became financially independent. Um, so, you know, snapshot, perfect life. I had a beautiful wife that supported me. I had two beautiful, healthy, happy girls. I was financially independent. I had a career I loved. I had a house. I had stability. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. I was still having these thoughts. I still wanted yep. to, you know, end my life in some way, shape or form. And it, it, it troubled me. Yeah. to the core and I knew I was it was one of the things where I was smart enough to not do it and not take action and not um, drink when I had those issues I knew I could see it coming in slow motion it'd be one little thing would trigger me whether it was traffic or a fight with the wife or a fight with the kids or you know trouble at work and that would spend me down a, 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 a you know a dark day for a couple of days so I was constantly looking for things to help me and some of those things led me to you know, alternative medicine. Some of those things led me to simple life. Some of those things led me to just trying to find a solution. I was, I was buying new toys. I'm like, Hey, if I just had a better car, it'd be cool. If I went on this vacation, I'd be better, you know, whatever it was. Um, and to this day, to this day, and actually, if you could help me with this, I'd love to see my application for Iron Mighty Oaks someday, <laughs> if I could find it. I have no idea how I found Mighty Oaks. I have no idea. I can't. Common I, story. I, 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 I've racked my brain trying to find it. It might have been through social media. But at some point, I, I filled out the application and just submitted it. And I got put in the pipeline for Mighty Oaks, and they contacted me and reached out. And we couldn't schedule anything that would work. Um, and then COVID hit, so it delayed some of the program. I was originally scheduled to go to California. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, through talking with, um, it was probably Brandon and you know, or some, one of the other admins, um, eventually I got scheduled for Ohio in May of 2021 and I was like, okay, great. All I knew about the program was, is for veterans and it was talking about, you know, depression, anxiety and, yeah. and PTSD and stuff. That's all I knew. So I had it on the calendar for May and, um, the Friday before I was supposed to go, I had my plane ticket, um, provided for me by Mighty Oaks, which is an incredible resource that you guys do. Um, I don't think people, enough people appreciate yeah, that sure. about how easy you guys make it to go to programs. I was scheduled to go, and that Friday before, um, my wife was very supportive of me going to this program. I went to the website. I was like, what is Mighty Oaks? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going like, now. Should, let me figure I'm out what it is. I'm, I'm on the <laughs> schedule. I got the week off. Let me figure out what I'm going to. <laughs> and the first thing I saw was faith-based, and my heart dropped mm. because I was an atheist. And, yeah. and in my thoughts, the thoughts that went through my mind and, and no offense to anybody, I was like, great. I'm about to go hang out in the middle of nowhere, Ohio with a bunch of Bible thumpers and this is going to be miserable. <laughs> and I actually called, I, I called, I, I emailed and I called uh, one of the program directors and I said, Hey, I'm an atheist. I didn't know if you guys knew about that. Me and luckily to that, they're like, yep, we saw that on your application. No worries. <laughs> like they were very inclusive. They were like, Hey, just come see what we have to say. Um, be respectful. Um, we've had witches come through the program. It, it, you don't have to be a person of faith to come to this yeah. program, but we think we can give you some tools to help. And so I kind of I said, okay, but I was nervous the entire time. I was nervous sure. the entire week. I was n nervous the entire time showing up. Um, and it, you know, even me talking here, you can tell I'm fairly transparent. I'm fairly you know not shy about kind of talking about things. And I let them know. I was like, yeah, I raised my hand. I was like, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in in a heaven or a hell. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in God. Um, and everyone was very supportive of that, which was really kind of surprising to me looking back. Um, my roommates and I, we would have conversations. We would have like long discussions about what do you think about this? What do you think about evolution? What do you think about um, these 
core teachings of the Bible. What do you think about, yeah. you know, where do you think the universe came from, the great, the Big Bang Theory? And you know, I wasn't a scientist, but I was like, well, this is what, but we had really good kind of debates back and forth, and they were all really respectful. And um, going through the week, um, you just had some really good conversations. My, my team leader actually joked, he's like, you're probably the worst atheist I've ever met. <laughs> um, and I think, I think part of that was because he's like, the fact that you even showed up here. Yeah, sure tells me you're not really a hardcore atheist. Right. I'm like, okay, that's a valid point. Um, <laughs> but all the way up until Thursday, so not to you know give away details of um, Fight Club and, and, and Mighty Oaks, but on Thursday, students give a personal testimony. I gave my personal testimony, which is an expanded story of why I was there. And at the end of it, um, you know, it was a very, it was an emotional time. It's a really powerful moment. Um, one of the guys asked me, he said, are you still an atheist? And I paused and I said, yeah, because I, I can't answer that question honestly. I'm not going to lie to anybody here. Sure. I'm not going to sit there and say I believe when I, when I truly don't. Um, and um, fast forward 12 hours later, and I believed. Mm. And it was mm. the Holy Spirit came into my heart at Mighty Oaks. Um, I couldn't write the script if I, if I would have tried. Um, I think it was really powerful. I think it's a really unique story. I don't think it's going to happen to everybody, but... Mm. Um, I prayed while I was at Mighty Oaks. I started doing the teachings. I was taking I was taking what Mighty Oaks was teaching me, and I was absorbing it. And I was just all these little seeds were being planted throughout the week, um, and and it led to a very profound moment on that Friday um, last class last activity three hours before graduation. And wow. it was one of those things where uh, I get chills even thinking about it because it, it just it just felt so so unreal and surreal and um it was a it wasn't like a light came down and you know struck me but it was it was a very clear sign from god that spoke to my heart and and softened my heart and um and i've been a believer a heart a, a hard believer ever since and I've, my life has been changed 180 i mean drastically if you and i were talking six months ago eight months ago it would be a very different conversation um and my life has been changed so much it's undescribable it's unreal how much my life has changed and and i understand that my yokes didn't necessarily convert me but they yeah. planted the seed sure. to allow me that opportunity and when i look back on it this is all part of god's plan god's plan led me to the application i in my yokes. he led yeah. me to you know being there he led me everything everything leading up to it um all the people at my yokes praying for me i've talked to leaders since then that they're like hey man i was praying for you across the country like we heard that you were there. We heard that you were an atheist. We heard your story. I was praying for you across the country. And to know that that was happening is, is really impactful and really um, just unbelievable to think about. But at the end of the day, it was all, it was all part of God's plan. So Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we talk about Mighty Oaks obviously a lot, but really what we do is just try to help people get to the place where they can, you know, allow God to speak to them and allow God to work in their lives. It's not Mighty Oaks. We're just a platform or a vehicle, right? And, and God does that work. Um, yep. Yep. What was, when you went home and you'd had that experience, um, how did your wife respond to that? What, what, <laughs> what, what's happened in your, you know, your family, you know, since then or the impact on kind of your life? Yeah, no, great question. So, um, the the last the last thing we do is there's a is kind of a reflection walk and that's that's kind of when I found Christ and when when the Holy Spirit entered my heart and it's almost like I didn't believe it at first mm -hmm. I was like was this it mm -hmm. was it I, I you know I expected the heavens to you know kind of get dark and a bolt of lightning come down I'm like right. that didn't happen but right. is this it and the more I kind of asked that question I was like yes yes and it just grew it grew it grew and the the feeling kind of grew. So the first person I told was my wife. Um, and we had talked throughout the week and she, you know, she knew what I was going through and she's like, Hey, how's it going? And I was really honest with her. I was like, yeah, there's some good lessons here. There's some good stuff. And I just texted her real quick, cause we we're about to go back and we had to, re you know, go back to lunch. And I, I texted her real quick. I said, I believe. And that's the only thing I told her. Hmm. And then I went down and, and talked to my team leader and talked to a couple of their leaders at my Oaks and they were all, they all embraced me. They're all really happy. And they're like, Hey, our, our prayers have been answered. And so that afternoon was just like a whirlwind of people finding out sure. and people, you know, kind of talking to me about it and like me kind of retelling the story, if you will. And then I talked to my wife that night and I let her know. I was like, 
I believe it. I, I was really adamant in her because she's she. We never attended church together. She believed in a higher power, but she wasn't necessarily a Christian. Yeah. Uh, I told her I was like, "Hey, I'm not going to come home, and like we're not. I don't want this to. I don't want you to think I'm going to come home and shove it down your guys' throats. This is a journey between me and God, and however that looks for you guys, I just want to be supportive. And and I really told her I was like, I want to be an example now. Right. I want to be an example right. of a better father. Right. I want to be an example of a better husband. I want you to see the changes in me, not just come home and say, hey, I'm a Christian. All our, all our problems are solved. Um, so I came home on that Saturday, attended church on Sunday, um, started looking for a church uh, to, to call home. Um, my wife was very supportive of it. Um, our, my daughters were very supportive of it. Um, they were 12 and 9 at the time. Um, you know, They were happy for me. And, and over the weeks, eventually my wife, she's like, I can see the difference. Wow. She told me, she's like, I can see it. It's clear. It's clear as day. You are a different person. She was really proud of me. She was supportive of helping me find a church. We found a church together. Um, I eventually got baptized um, in August. And that baptism in August was the first time my children attended church. No kidding. Wow. And and I remember like, very significantly that night, I talked to my nine-year-old daughter. And because she listened to the sermon, she that was the first time they really experienced a church service. And I was like, did you, did you hear anything you liked? Did you, what did you think of the preacher? What did you think of the sermon? And I remember she, she was very, she's a very smart little girl. And she said, I was like, did you learn anything today? And she said, she said, I learned that you um, can run from God, but you can't outrun God. <laughs> so some of the lessons yeah. that we were like hearing in scriptures, it was starting to soak into her. Yeah. And then uh, we started reading the Bible together. I started reading the Bible with my younger daughter wow. and then eventually you know, my older daughter got involved in the youth programs and I, I haven't really shoved it down their throats, but I'm, I'm talking to them about it. Yes. And, and there hasn't been major changes, you know, um, but we, we, we speak the Bible together. We talk about different lessons of the Bible. They both have uh, a Jesus calling book now that I just encourage them like, Hey, just, just read something today and just pick up a lesson. So thinking back to my childhood, religion was never shoved down my throat and I never wanted to do that to them. Right. Um, but the, the impact and the way that I've been a better husband and a better um, father and a better friend yeah. um, has been amazing. And I've, I've met a lot of really good mentors. I've, I've been involved in Bible studies and, and trying to reach out to other folks. And then going back to my Oaks as a, as a team leader candidate, getting back involved in that. So I understand it's going to be a long kind of marathon process, but I just take it day by day. Yeah, and I, I'd be sure to you know follow the lessons from my yokes of you know, being in scripture and being in fellowship and um, doing stuff like this and just kind of talking about it and, and sharing my testimony. I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, and, and just sharing, hey, this is what happened with me. Like, I'm not saying it's going to happen with you, but this is this is the changes you can see um, yeah. in that. So it, it's been it's been it's been crazy. I think it's only it's only been six months. Sure. Um, but it's still developing. It's That's still awesome. developing. Yeah. Well, an authentic faith from a parent, I think, is the most powerful thing you can provide for your family. You know, it's one thing to tell your kids or your wife, this is what we should do. It's another thing to live that authentically. And I think that's that's super powerful. Um, last question is this. Um, when you think about hope, because certainly there was a, a lot of hopelessness in your life. Um, when you think about hope, um, how do you how do you think about that? And, and where can someone who's like, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but I have no hope. Where is that hope found? So how do you think about hope and where is hope found for those who are in search of it? Um, great question. Um, so for me personally, like, you know, life hasn't there. I, I've had some bad days since since Mighty Oaks, sure. since finding Christ nothing's perfect but those days now i find hope in those days that i just i lean i lean into it extra yeah. hard that day yeah and and i'm, I'm walking the walk every single day whether it's a, a little prayer or, or reading the scripture or following a bible study plan or just you know a quick little prayer um and and, and being that example um but on the days that i'm struggling or the days that it is a little bit harder um i just kind of lean into it more and just um you know pray a little bit harder that day and struggle with it so and um so for other individuals when i think about hope even even going back to my journey and how i found my yokes i just always say don't stop you just can't yeah, stop that's good whatever that solution is whatever whether it's religion or whether it's you know something else or a different 
whatever whatever you're struggling with like you just have to take another step if you're struggling financially like take another step towards solving that problem if you're struggling with your marriage take another step towards you know counseling or some sort of thing if you're struggling mentally like look in different therapies look into different medications look whatever that is but i mean that hope is 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 a daily thing and and that's what gives me faith and that's what gives me peace now like so I, I'm confident each day and I've been confident each day about my life because I know that, you know, going back to control, what you control, I can't control what my life looks like in five years, 10 years, sure. next week. Sure. I can't control if a client's going to come over to me. I can't control how my daughters are going to, you know, live their lives, but I can control what I do on a daily basis. I can control, you know, how I act and yeah. how I um, approach that day. And the peace that I have is knowing that God is in control of that one day. That's good. Like he's That's good. going to help control that day. And this day is going to help tomorrow, which is going to help this. And, and, and I just, my constant prayer is like, God, show me my path. And I don't know what that path is. I don't know if it's something else. I don't know if it's continuing to be a financial advisor. That was one of the first things I asked as soon as I got home. I was like, okay, God, you put me on this path of a military officer, financial advisor, is this still my path? And I yeah. still ask that question every day. I'm like, is this still my path? And so I'm always looking for, um, you know, for him to guide me on what that path is. So for okay. someone, for anyone in a situation of hopelessness or they need hope, um, it's just to remember that is, listen, just take it day by day and whatever it is, pick up that one thing. If, like absorb that one moment of crisis and, Maybe it's you're just hungry at that moment. Mm. Great, go get a cheeseburger. Yeah, right. Maybe that maybe that gets you to another hour. Maybe yeah. that gets you to another day, and then just continue putting one foot in front. Keep of move, moving forward. The other and and, and and yeah, that that's really it. And whatever yeah. whatever it's Mighty Oaks or whether it's another program or whether it's a hobby or yeah. you know whatever situation you're in, there's always there's always a way out of it. Um, and and God's gonna show that to you, or you're gonna find it in some yeah. other way. Um, but that's, that's kind of my message of when it comes to hope and, you know, kind of just chipping away at it. That's good. So. Uh, Brandon, where can people, um, find you? I know you have a personal website. Um, and then where can people who are interested in, you know, kind of the tools that you provide for transitioning veterans, where can they find that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm very, um, open and, and easy to find publicly. Um, you know, when I first started my business, I used to Google my name and a mugshot of a guy, some guy in Iowa would show up. But now I think if you Google my name, um, at least the website or like I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook. Yep. Um, I do have a personal website, which is brandonbettis.com, which is kind of more financial based, but my phone number's on there, my email's on there. Um, um, I'm on Veterati, but literally I, I, I don't have a super unique name. Um, just if you can't remember, it's like Jerome Bettis. You're going to get two Google results. You're going to be Jerome Bettis. That's for Brandon Bettis. Um, and so, so I'm usually pretty easy to find. Um, so if anyone needs to reach out, um, I, I'm connected enough that um, you'll be able to get to me. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you coming on and, uh, and the time and being willing to tell your, tell your story. It's super helpful. Um, yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate, I appreciate everything Mighty Oaks, Mighty Oaks has done for me. I appreciate your support. Um, and sure. uh, you know, hopefully we can help some other people along the way. That's awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and then for those of you that are watching or listening, thanks for doing that. Appreciate it. Uh, share this episode out. So much good information for transitioning veterans, folks who are just struggling in life and um, need resources. Share this out. That would be helpful to them, I'm sure. Thank you for watching and uh, listening, and we'll talk to you next week.